what we find is that um, that happens in animals when we push out their longevity. Um, the population tends to die quicker and the individuals die more quickly. They uh, either die from a, we think, from, from a, either a uh, cardiac arrest or kidney failure, something like that. Which is very different to how we and mice currently live if, you're, if you don't treat them, which is up to a decade in a nursing home. Which is why when, you, when I ask most people, uh, do you want to live longer? The answer is absolutely not, because they imagine that being old is horrible. But old is relative. Um, I don't think of 90 as being old anymore. And I certainly don't think of my father, who's 82, as being old. In fact, he's fitter, healthier, more vibrant, and has a, a mind that's just as quick as mine at 82. And by the way, when we reach that, it's not really a question of if, it's just a question of when. Uh, we or they will look back at today in horror at how we practice medicine. So I'm going to talk about the epigenome. Many of you will have heard of this. Uh, when I was at MIT studying yeast aging with Leonard Guarenti, uh, there was a breakthrough in the lab. Uh, Brian Kennedy, who now runs a big center at Singapore, he used to run the Buck Institute. Uh, just as I was at coming to the lab, uh, he discovered that there was a mutation in a gene in yeast that extended their lifespan by 30%. And its name was SIR4. And what's really interesting about the name SIR is it's an acronym for Silent Information Regulator. And that was a huge shock to us because we were looking for, we thought we'd find DNA repair genes and antioxidants, that was the theory. But no, we found, he found an information regulator. So what's that? That's an epigenetic regulator, a gene that controls other genes. And we thought, what is that? And so what we came up with was, with was the idea that this SIR gene was making a protein that would go and slow down other genes that caused aging. Um, to cut a long story short, we figured out uh, pretty quickly within a matter of years uh, why the yeast cells were getting old, what the role of these SIR genes had, um, and pretty much built the entire theory that I'll tell you about today. Um, I don't know if you're on Instagram, but I think two posts ago, I put my notebook on uh, Instagram. It's a picture of me in, when I was 18 or 16, dreaming about this. And then if you flick through, you can see the notes that I wrote. It's five or six pages in my notebook that basically spelled out my entire career that I've been working on ever since. <laughs> in October, on October 26, 1996. That night changed my, my world for sure. And what we came up, I came up with was the idea that um, genomic instability, changes to DNA, breaks to, to chromosomes, distract these gene regulators, these silent information regulators, and you get changes to the epigenome. Now, what's the epigenome? I'll just briefly, I'll tell you. So in this picture, the DNA is the blue, and the epigenome are the structures that regulate the DNA. So when we're being, when we fertilized and we develop in the embryo, we end up having different tissues, different cell types, and that's the epigenome's job. It's essentially, you have a, a master playlist of notes on a piano or, or songs on a CD. The epigenome is the pianist, or in the case of the CD, the reader. Um, and every song is different for every cell type. It has to be, because the genomes are identical. Um, and so what we came up with was the idea that changes to the epigenome that in part are caused by massive cell damage, stress, uh, well, critical damage, including broken chromosomes, were driving these changes. Now what's interesting about this is that that second letter in that name, the information, is key. And so it's my theory that in epigenetic information loss is the primary cause of aging. Now there are two types of information. I've just told you there's the epigenetic information, which is stored in these structures here. And then there's the, the genetic information, which is the DNA. And the difference between the two is huge. DNA is digital. It's base 4, ATCG. It's actually quite robust. I, I could take your cells and I could, you know, with a little bit of work, but I could literally clone you, make a new you, make an egg, make a sperm, fertilize you. You could be a new you. We do this with animals all the time by cloning. So the DNA in the adult body is intact, largely. There are mutations, of course, which we could correct. But the fact that we can clone from cells tells us that it's, 
very unlikely that it's the DNA itself that's causing aging. We think it's the epigenetic information. Now, what's interesting about that is epigenetic information is analog largely, and analog looks like most of us are old enough to have experienced the world in analog. Analog information degrades very quickly. It's the reason we switched to digital in the first place. So what we've been finding in animals and in people is that the loss of epigenetic information is the problem. And by manipulating the epigenome in yeast, and we've done this now in worms, we've done this in mice, we're going to do this in humans, we can drive aging forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards. We can control aging now quite easily once we understand what's going on. And these other hallmarks of aging, which of course are important, mitochondrial dysfunction, prote prote loss of proteostasis, there's a long list of course, uh, even telomere loss. Uh, the evidence suggests, and I'm proposing, that these defects stem from the loss of cells' ability to control which genes are on and off. And cells lose their identity and their ability to defend themselves against the environment and toxins, and just homeostasis breaks down. So we, we have experiments to test this that have been going on for over a decade now, some of which are, I'll tell you about today that we haven't published yet. Uh, one of the key chemical modifications is called methylation. Uh, you can methylate those proteins. You can methylate the DNA. And what Steve Horvath found that really jibed with our theory, and this is going back now um, about seven, eight years ago, is that these DNA methylation uh, chemical additions change at some places in the genome. There are a few thousand of them. Uh, they change with precision and reproducibility and you can actually use machine learning to train um, an algorithm that will allow you to back calculate somebody's biological age, not just their chronological age. So I could take all of your DNA, I could take a mouth swab, go back to my lab and give you an estimate of your true biological age, how frail you're going to be in the future, and even an estimate of when you're going to die if you don't change your lifestyle. <laughs> But to that point, what we've learned, and there's papers that come out every day, I just tweeted about one last night, is that the interventions we know are good for us turn out to be those that slow aging. Mediterranean diet was a study that came out last night, or yesterday. Exercise. If you do these things, you generally have a, s a slower biological clock than someone who smokes and gets obese and doesn't do those good things. By the way, there's a study that you may not know about, which I have to tell you, is that by studying populations, they found that if you just do the five main things that doctors would tell you to do, which is don't overeat, don't overdrink, don't smoke, uh, do some exercise. I think I forget what the fourth one was. It might have been sleep. But those, the things that we all know to do, if you do those compared to those who don't, you live an extra 14 years. So when I go up on stage or I talk to colleagues and I say, we're going to live another 20, 30 years, like, oh, come on, that, don't be ridiculous. You know, that's not a good look for a scientist. I think you can already do 15, you know, 14, 15. That's the easy stuff. Um, and there's a lot more we can do. So anyway, this is the epigenome, and we've been manipulating it for a while now, uh, including in yeast back in the 1990s and extending lifespan that way. And really what you want to do is stabilize your epigenome or re reboot it, reset it. And the analogy that I used in my book is this, the CD analogy, that the DNA is the music and aging is the scratches so that the, the cells really can't read the right genes or in this analogy, the songs are skipping around and cells lose their ability to function. We find that old brain cells from animals are uh, more like skin cells. You know, of course, you're not going to be able to think correctly if your brain forgets what it's supposed to do. The good news is that we think there's a way to polish off those scratches or in the body, remind our old cells how to work again and be young again and literally be young again. Uh, senescence uh, is another outcome, I think, of epigenetic noise when cells lose their ability to function and reach a state where they are jeopardizing the organism, potentially becoming cancerous, there are mechanisms to shut those cells down. And this is what's called cellular senescence. And uh, 
In this diagram, you can see on, on the right, these pink cells are accumulation of senescent cells. And so many of you will have heard of this, and there are ways, both with supplements and supplements plus drugs, that appear to be very effective in getting rid of these cells. And if you do that in a mouse, the mice are rejuvenated. Uh, here are the clocks. We build these all the time in my lab. We do it in, for mice. Uh, we can do it for their blood, their skin. We've got a human clock. Um, there's so many clocks, it's, it's not even, you know, we, it's even hard to keep up. And the clocks are getting better, at better and better and better at predicting health and longevity, but also other things such as metabol future metabolic health, future fertility. And this is what we're working on. The other thing we have is a breakthrough in reducing the cost of these tests. Right now, the, to run them, it probably would cost most people a few hundred dollars uh, commercially. Uh, at best, you'd be down to $100 per person. Uh, we can now multiplex. We can pull 1,000 people, run it for the same cost as one. Uh, so this cost of this test is going to be essentially free uh, in, a, in a couple of years, which means that we can regularly test ourselves for what is happening when we take a supplement, when we exercise, when we change diet. And we're finding, actually, that these clocks are... That they, first of all, they have to be very accurate, but when you get accuracy, then you also can see that they change. And this study from yesterday was a 24-month study, um, though I think we can probably see changes earlier. But within those two years, those who are on the, the, the healthy diet, quote-unquote healthy diet, which, by the way, I, I wrote what was in the diet, if you want to see, on that tweet. Um, so it's a lot of olive oil, the usual stuff. Um, don't over-drink. You can drink a bit of red wine. There was uh, whole grains, cut back on red meat, don't eat processed meat, that kind of stuff. Those women had a much lower rate of aging than those that didn't adopt that diet. Um, so this, is, this was a key experiment that we did. We had proposed that DNA breaks that break a chromosome distract the sirtuin epigenetic regulators, and they go to the break, and then they have to find their way back, and they don't do that efficiently. And we proposed that in a cell paper in 2009, but then we had to test if that's true. And the hypothesis predicted that if we create chromosomal breaks that have to be put back together multiple times, even if we reestablish the genome, so there's no change to the DNA content, the epigenome will change, and it will cause aging. That was the prediction. And I remember people in the lab saying, these mice are going to die, they're going to get cancer, come on, that's ridiculous. Uh, but, you know, we like to do the ridiculous uh, in my lab. The other thing that we like to say is we make the impossible possible. So we did the experiment. Actually, my job, the hardest part of my job is convincing people to do an experiment uh, because they, they take a while. This is what's called an ice mouse. This is the control mouse. It was, um, its sibling was treated uh, at age five months. A mouse typically lives a bit over two years, and then it was another uh, 10 months after that treatment. We treat them for three weeks, and we accelerate their epigenome so that by 16 months of age, the treated mice look like this. And this is not just an, a, an old-looking mouse by every measure, this histology, biochemistry, gene expression, and the biological clock. This mouse is older, and we've done thousands of them. There's, it's highly reproducible. And now we're working on, well, we've slowed this down. We have ways of doing that, I'll tell you. But we also are working on reversing this process. Uh, one of the ways to reverse aging is to use a, a molecule that raises NAD levels. Uh, we showed uh, early 2000s that in yeast, if you raise NAD production, the yeast cells live longer by turning on the sirtuins. The sirtuin enzymes need NAD. We need it for life. Sirtuins also need it. Uh, and they stabilize the epigenome. They repair DNA, and they protect mitochondria and proteins and telomeres. Think of sirtuins as the guardians of our body. But as we get older, we lose NAD production. We have less of it in our skin. It's estimated we have half the levels at age 50 that we had when we were 20. You can raise the levels in an animal and in a human two to threefold by giving precursors to NAD. NAD itself, we can talk about how effective that might be. But these mice have been fed NMN for just four weeks in their water supply. And I think you can tell the one that was drinking NMN water versus the one that wasn't. The mice on the left could run 50% further, and when we gave it to young mice and exercised them, they ran so far the treadmill stopped working. 
and we thought we broke it. Um, turns out the software was never written for a mouse to run more than three kilometers, so we had to rewrite the software. So we figured out how, we published this in 2018, we figured out how it works, we think. Um, the lining of the blood vessels gets old, it doesn't respond to muscle signals. And what happens to us, we know this, is that even if we exercise when we're old, we don't grow a lot of blood vessels, and our organs get starved for oxygen, particularly our brain and our muscles, which use, and heart, which use a lot of oxygen. But when you give mice NMN, NAD levels go up, CERT1, the, the equivalent of that yeast surge gene, uh, now allows the muscle and the brain uh, to signal to the blood vessels to grow. So these, these mice on the left have more blood vessels, like a young mouse, actually without even having trained. 